Hi ladies and gentlemen, welcome to part two. In what I think might be a three part series, you never know, you never know, we will be responding to your questions and um, maybe developing Skype sessions as we get to the end of the parenting styles course. I think maybe we could do a three part series and then open it up to a, a Skype and a Zoom meeting type of platform. We'll have to wait and see where this is going to end up. All right, but this, at this moment in time, welcome to part two. And part two is going to be looking at three specific parenting styles. All right, now um, I just need to send out one or two flares and um, just remind you guys that these parenting styles, the information in these parenting styles is going to challenge every one of us, whether we come from a chemical dependency history or not. All right, please keep this in mind. None of, all of us have some of these traits, but none of us have all of them. All right, this is not about saying to you, because you did this and because your attitude was that and because of your behavior, your kid's a smackhead, a crackhead or a prostitute. That's not what this is about. All right, addiction, chemical dependency is an individual family cultural plague. All right, we need a vaccine. Oh boy, do we need a vaccine, all right? The scientists all over the world are busy trying to construct a vaccine for COVID-19 and God bless them in their endeavors. Um, in my opinion, addictions are being conceived even during this lockdown period. Uh, relationships are changing within the homes, emotional conditions are changing within the homes, the psychology of um, people is changing within the homes and I, my fear is that a lot of people are going to become chemically dependent within the next three years because of COVID-19. So whilst we're in the mindset of hoping for a vaccine, I need to take responsibility for the information I've received over the past 27 years as an addictions specialist, 15 years of which was at the helm of a private sector internationally sought after treatment center where we brought in men and women from all over the world. The, the results we were getting were absolutely astounding. Now, COVID-19 pretty much closes everything down, no international travel. All right, that's fine, we'll come to you. We've closed the clinic, done, finished. Our program now is at your disposal, all right? I need to take responsibility for the information I've received over all these years. And I need to step into, if you will allow me, I need to step into your lives, into your homes, into your relationships between husband and wife, between parents and children, all right? Because as I say, addiction is an individual, family, cultural thing. And if we want to construct a vaccine against the spread of this disease, this cancer, we have to get a crystal clear look at exactly what the virus looked like and the parenting styles with which we were born into and then with which those that we passed on to our children, our parenting styles contain various strands of the virus of chemical dependency. It doesn't mean you're a bad parent. It really, you might be a bad parent, but you're not a bad parent because of these parenting styles. All right, we're gonna go through several, what would on the surface of things seem to be quite innocent parenting styles. We're just starting part two now. We're looking at parenting styles predisposing children to a high risk of chemical dependency, and we're gonna be looking at teetotal parenting, the influence within teetotal parents. And then we're gonna be looking at the influence within parents who have unrealistic demands. And thirdly, we will be looking at um, parents whose influence is one of overprotection, okay? So we're gonna be looking at excuse me for a moment, we're gonna be looking at teetotal parenting, unrealistic demands and overprotection. And they might all seem quite sincere, quite um, innocent on the surface of things. Right, we need to look, we need to establish the exact nature of the virus. So we've got to, if we need, if we really truly want this vaccine against the spread of addictions, 
we can't say, well, because I'm not doing so badly or because my parenting style is not that bad, I don't really need to do this. You're on this website for a reason. And I hope the next few parenting styles belong to you because they are not so deeply ingrained within the psyche and the relation skills of our kids. They just cause just enough damage to create just enough damage with substances. But it doesn't necessarily mean these guys are gonna need psychiatric care, clinical psychologist, a private addictions and treatment center. This can be turned around now with good information, empowerment and mentoring. All right, so I'm gonna show you a PowerPoint presentation. It's quite a long one, guys. What a drag this has been. I've been afraid of missing something out. What do I not say? So I thought, ah, let's say it, man. Let's get on with it. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna play with my little, my mouse down here, and I'm gonna start this PowerPoint presentation. We're gonna start recording it and we're gonna go through it together, okay? What I want you to do is listen for what you can identify rather than try and identify what's not wrong with you, all right? We have to establish the exact nature of the virus, the virus of addiction. And those vi the strands of those virus, unfortunately, can very often stretch back into the home, into the parenting styles. All right, and all we've got to do is take ownership of it. So as you go through the slides, as we go through these slides together, I want you to stop wherever you feel necessary and take notes. I want you to identify when something points at you. If you feel like you're being pointed at or spoken to, if you think that your spouse has phoned me and told me about you, and that's why I'm saying this, that's what you need to focus on. We have a gallery of recovery coaches, men and women around the world who have got years of recovery from family chaos, um, alcoholism, eating disorders, various types of addictions. And we've all got years of recovery. We have a gallery of recovery coaches that you can look for. And I want you to email them and email me, okay? Email us, tell us what it was you identified. And then as we get to the end of the course, we can start binding it all together. And then we can maybe arrange our chat rooms. We can start connecting with each other. And this is now home help addiction intervention. Enjoy the PowerPoint presentation. There we go, guys. We're looking at parenting styles, predisposing children to a high risk of becoming chemically dependent, part two and the three parenting styles that we're going to explore in part two, teetotal, unrealistic demands, and overprotection. Okay, the ehab.care parenting styles course is, has, was actually born in the six month um, online diploma I did with the Behavioural Institute in Dublin. Their website, www.thebehaviorinstitute.com. When my wife and I first opened the rehab and we didn't have any children or we just had our first child and we were opening this rehab, I was trying to run a rehab and trying to be a parent. And in order to kind of empower myself further, I contacted the Behavioural Training Institute in Dublin and I did a six month online diploma in parent-child psychology. That should be in schools before kids fall pregnant. That should, this, these kind of courses, this should be standard information. Never mind academia, okay? You won't keep a good child down, but a good child will not know what direction to turn in if we don't step into their psyche and start empowering them from within with courses akin to the um, parent-child psychology course. I also did a six-month addiction psychology course with the same comp with the same organisation. Absolutely brilliant. I've been counselling for. 15 years when I did the course and I realized man wow this is like gravy on a Sunday dinner all right so if you go to the website you'll see the Behavior Institute and ehab.care can introduce you to the um, the Institute itself and or maybe you can just contact the behavior 
ask to connect with John Crimmins and say, Colin's giving you my address, all right? Put a plug in there for Colin, all right? So the 10 parenting styles that I'm going through, um, I think we did parenting styles, I think we did four parenting styles or maybe five within the diploma and it got me to thinking about the various other parenting styles that I have personally identified and so we're going to the next two or three will be reliant upon the information from the diploma um, that we've put our own salt on okay I'm not trying to plagiarize I'm not trying to steal from the Institute it doesn't really matter where you get the flowers from the arrangement is my is my own okay so Take a note of this website address and go and have a look at them. Now tune in. Parenting styles influenced by teetotalism. It's not just teetotal, it's teetotalism. Okay, T is not the problem. Teetotal is not the problem. Teetotalism is a pain in the neck. Okay, alcohol is not a problem. Alcoholism is the cancer that brings us to this website. Okay, so we're gonna maybe please count the letters in each of the words. Teetotal is not a problem. Teetotalism is a bully. All right, we have four flavors of teetotal one, healthy, two, cultural, three, dogmatic, it's going dodgy now, see, and four, recovering. And that's a downhill spiral, okay? That's downhill from healthy. Healthy, cultural, dogmatic, and recovering. And we really need to unpack each of these conditions, each of these approaches, because each teetotal type comes with its own set of attitudes and behaviors. And that's what we've got to scrutinize. It doesn't matter how much you drink, it's your attitude before the drink, during the drink, and after the drink. It doesn't matter how much, how often you drink, it's what happens after you drink. How do you behave? The ism, it's not the alcohol, it's the ism. It's not the teetotal, it's the teetotal ism. Okay, so we're going to go through each of these parenting styles and we're going to look at um, behaviours and attitudes of each of them. All right, I'm just going to turn my phone off so it stops pinging. Number one, healthy teetotal. Just normal, everyday teetotal, eh? Everyday teetotal. This is not teetotalism, this is just healthy teetotal. And in the homes where parents um, are teetotal, you will find a stability and a consistency of attitudes and behaviors. Let's have a look at the attitudes, some of the attitudes that we find, that you'll find in that home that's able and stable and all cards on the table. Attitudes, these guys are humble. You've got nothing to prove, they're just humble, just naturally type of humble, they're open-minded. And you know, humble and open-minded people, you'll find always kind. All right, there's no self-self in the humble, open-minded, teetotal husband and or wife. And that comes with a degree of patience. They're patient and you'll see, you don't have to look too hard, self-controlled. These are kind of default attitudes within moms and dads who run their homes, govern their homes, parent their homes from the position of teetotal. That's not a bad, influence to for our children to inherit it really is a decent inheritance behaviors of healthy teetotal parents consistently honest realistic accountable rational and reliable and the most important word of all that consistently <laughs> i forgot the word then when i said that consistently the attitudes and the behaviors of the teetotal, healthy, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually able, stable cards on the table. Humble, open-minded, kind, patient and self-controlled. Consistently honest, realistic, accountable, rational and reliable. Alright? That might not apply to you. 
That's great, honestly, fantastic. I might need some guidance from you in the coming few months, and I really don't mind if I do. I hope it does. However, nobody's on this website for fun, and it's downhill from this. <laughs> Don't shoot me, man. I'm just a messenger boy. I say it with joy because I know what's coming. There's a, there's this, what we're going to go into now is the swamp of parenting styles that can predispose kids to a high risk of coming chemi becoming chemically dependent. But we're not going to leave you in that swamp. Stick with us, man. All right. So God bless the healthy teetotal parents, I say. The second parenting style that can predispose our kids to all kinds of chaos is cultural teetotalism. It's cultural and it's teetotalism. It might only be um, kind of a softer, more gentle-ism, but it becomes, when teetotal is cultural, it comes with an ism. All right, and I hope you maybe get to understand what that means as we go through the course and as you maybe visit the other lectures and um, if you go to our YouTube channel, you'll find lectures on there. There's one particular lecture, there's one particular clip, it's called Objective Subjective. It's called True Recovery and False Recovery. Go and have a look at that. That, will, that speaks into the ism of alcohol. Alcohol's never been a problem. Alcoholism has always been a problem. And now we go into cultural teetotalism, attitudes and behaviours. I'm looking down because I've got my screen underneath the camera, so I'm not being rude. Please forgive me. Well, yeah, maybe I am being rude, but please forgive me anyway. Attitudes and behaviours of cultural teetotalism. Attitudes. Close-minded. Pious. Expectant. Intolerant because they're programmed. These are the ingrained, this is what these guys, this is the default when they, when they wake up in the morning. They're culturally teetotal. And they, if you look at the cultural teetotal, I watch a lot of the videos like um, Escaping Amish and these religious cults where, where women, where moms have just had enough and you see within them that women actually run away and leave their children behind. Parents run off and leave their children behind. They're so, they've been suppressed and oppressed for so long, it's cultural, I would call it cultural, certainly teetotalism. The only reason they don't drink alcohol is they're not allowed. That's not sobriety. Not being allowed to drink alcohol doesn't mean you're sober. Your attitudes and your, the influence that you have in the relationships with, that you are engaged in with the people around you. The quality of the influence I have in your heart and mind, in every conversation that we have, will determine whether or not I'm sober or dry drunk, cultural teetotal, close-minded, pious, expectant, intolerant and programmed. Their behaviours demanding but silently demanding, that's the killer, okay? Demanding, unrealistic, isolated, compliant, and passive aggressive. Impossible to live with. Well, you can exist with them, but relationally, it's, it's non-existent, all right? Because they are culturally, I was gonna say culturally formed, they're actually culturally deformed, all right? I can't tell you how many, um, I'm, I'm based in South Africa, all right and we're it this is now 2020 we've been doing addiction treatment since 2005 so we have been counseling the children of mums and dads who came out of the apartheid regime okay and that's not a bad word that apartheid regime what happened in apartheid was terrible but the regime started out well with good intentions all right so i'm told but the children who have come into this new era, this new um, lifestyle with a new worldview, a bit like our children will be after COVID, these guys who were born maybe in apartheid, their parents have not been able to parent them about how to relate in society in uh, democracy. Where, where 
black lives really do matter. Okay? So there's this internal collapse in a large portion of a large generation of kids who the parenting styles from within apartheid don't work today. So the parenting style has predisposed them to a high uh, likelihood of becoming chemically dependent and we keep counseling them. And what we see is they are demanding. I can sit with the old school um, Africana mom and dad or grandparents and they are <clears throat> almost stoic in their demeanor they've never drunk alcohol <clears throat> and their children are smoking crack smoking weed stealing robbing cheating lying and coming to us for addiction treatment and it's cultural teetotalism and it's not just the Afrikaners it's you, you've got different religions Okay, the main religions of the world frown upon the evils of drink. The drink isn't evil, it's the ism within the alcoholic that blah, 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 all right? So that's cultural teetotalism. These guys are not teetotal by choice. These guys are teetotal because that's their culture and this is what you, you fit in or leave, okay? Three. Dogmatic teetotalism, this is where it really starts to go downhill. Attitudes and behaviours. Dogmatic attitudes. They're grandiose, okay? The dogmatic teetotal, absolutely grandiose. They're grandiose, they're judgmental, they're intolerant, they're impulsive, and yet they remain indecisive. How can they remain indecisive? Well, these guys, on the whole, are the children of the cultural teetotals. This is the progression of the, the culturally teetotalistic worldview gives birth to these youngsters with their attitudes of unrealistic demands and all kinds of stuff. And these guys really fight to follow in the footsteps of their ancestors and they become dogmatic teetotal. And they're actually quite grandiose, judgmental, intolerant, impulsive, and indecisive. We always find that these guys, they just can't make a decision, man. They've been kind of shepherded. The parenting style is predisposing them to a high likelihood of chemical dependency because of the consequential identity crisis. If you shepherd your child in a way that you think that they need to go and they go into a career that you want them to go in and they mix with, they only mix with the people that you want them to mix with, you're, you're distorting their true sense of self and there's a strong possibility that they can come out dogmatically teetotal. So that's dogmatic teetotalism, okay? The behaviors of the dogmatically teetotal. Dogmatically, is that a word? But it is now, eh? Denying, volatile, blaming, belligerent, bullying. And we all know people like this. I met a guy about in 2004 when we first started constructing our rehab and he was the guy that lived in he owned a hotel 75 work 75 staff on his workforce um fantastic hotel in the middle of this really beautiful idyllic africa Afri excuse me south african village and i met him and within 90 seconds of talking to him he was telling me i've not had a drink of whiskey for 17 years I used to drink four bottles of whiskey a day. I'm not, we weren't talking about whiskey. We weren't talking about him. We weren't talking about his achievements. He could not keep it suppressed. That he's not had a drink of whiskey for 17 years at that point. And if you meet that guy today, he will now tell you that he's not had a drink of whiskey for over 32 years. He's dry drunk. He's drunk on his own achievements. He's dogmatically teetotal, impossible to live with. In the first 10 years of not drinking whiskey, he destroyed the confidence in two wives. And the third wife left him about five years ago. In the first 15 years of him not drinking whiskey, his workforce changed about 15 times. Impossible to live with, impossible to work for. That's not sober. That's not the kind of sober I would ever want to 
exhibit in front of my kids. That's drive drunk, that's dogmatically teetotal, okay? I hope this is starting to make sense. You see, that's the ism. That's dogmatically, that's dogmatic teetotal ism. To put down the alcohol and not drink the alcohol doesn't mean sober. Abstinence from the alcohol added to abstinence from the alcohol equals abstinence from the alcohol, not recovery, all right? Abstinence from the alcohol added to personal change. What do I need to change? What is it about me that didn't work so well? What is it about me? Why are my kids scared of me? Why does the dog run away when I come home? What is it about me? Alcohol, um, abstinence from the alcohol, plus accountability, integrity, self-honesty, willingness to change, open-mindedness, equals recovery, equals change. Alcohol, abstinence from alcohol, added to abstinence from alcohol, simply adds up to abstinence from alcohol. Abstinence from alcohol, drugs, whatever it is, plus change, brings a whole new world, man. A completely new world. And I've got a team of men and women who are living in that new world. You've got to meet these guys, eh? Okay, before we go any further, let's take a look at what dogma means, all right? Dogma is an official system of principles or doctrines of a religion <laughs> or a position of a philosophical school of thought, okay? You've got this religion, it's the mindset, it's groupthink, it's a dogmatic way of thinking, okay? Dogma can also manifest itself, though, from behind a mask of contempt for people who don't drink tea like we do, for contempt, uh, of contempt for people who do drink alcohol. It's called snobbery. Let me tell you something, man, there are no snobs in recovery. Uh-uh. You can't do both. You can't be a snob in recovery. A snob is just a dry drunk, okay? Dogma can also manifest itself from behind a mask of contempt, of disapproval, and a series, or because of a series of enforced decisions. The way I live my life is how I'm going to make my children live their life, and we inoculate them, we, we even flatter them, that this is the right way, you're doing so well, and we predispose the next generation to a high likelihood of not really wanting what we've got, and then as soon as they take that first glass of sherry or wine or they smoke that first weed and that sense of relief comes, that relief is relief from you. If you're dogmatically teetotal, that sense of relief that these adolescents receive when they first interact, interact with the mind and mood altering substance, it really is a mind and mood altering substance. It changes the way they think and they feel. And that freedom is freedom from you, it's freedom from us, it's freedom from the influence we've had that drove them to the drug dealer's door. That's dogma. And that's what dogmatically teetotal people, that's the influence we pass on. I think it's essential that we dig into this. Okay, let's have a look at some the dogmatic attitudes. And I'm going to go through them one at a time with you. Attitudes and behaviours, we're going through them one at a time. I don't want you to look for um, how well you're doing. Really, you're not going to, what you won't face up to will never change. In fact, what you won't face up to is going to keep controlling your life and, and governing the temperature within your relationships. All right, so let's go into dogmatic attitudes. Grandiosity, judgmentalism, intolerance, impulsivity, and indecisiveness. I don't know if indecisiveness is a word, but I'm sure you know what I mean. Let's go from the top there. Dogmatic attitudes, one, grandiosity. What is grandiosity? Okay, it can be called arrogance. It can, it's, this is what it is, it's an exaggerated importance, self-importance. We've got an exaggerated opinion about our importance. And that exaggerated opinion about our importance applies to our strengths and our weaknesses. Either way, 
The great me is the center of attention. The big me, who has all the answers, or the poor me, whose cup of suffering and self-pity overflows. It's grandiosity, absolute horrible grandiosity, very, very difficult to live with. But it is something that we can create within our children because as we live with our grandiose attitude, we can bully the children into submission so that they adopt the same kind of attitude. It's just, this has really got to be looked at, man. The consequences of not looking at this stuff has brought us to our knees as, a, as an individual, as a family, as a culture, as a country, as a world. Dogmatic, uh, dogmatic attitudes too, judgmental, judgmental. Judgmentalism and grandiosity walk hand in hand. We believe that we have the right to judge other people's shortcomings. The problem is we judge others as a way of avoiding our own self-criticism. We judge others as harshly as we actually feel about ourselves. You know when you pick on somebody and you zoom in on somebody and you say, no, they're so arrogant, that's you. As we judge is as we are. If you spot it, you've got it. Oh, she's so selfish. How can she, she's so selfish. Why can't we talk about me for a change, which is selfish? Oh, they're so greedy. Why can't I have the blah, blah, blah. As we judge is as we are. But rather than face our own selfishness, our own arrogance, our own grandiosity, we would rather point it out in others and we judge them terribly. Dogmatic attitude three, intolerance. <laughs> and that's how I want it, intolerance. Intolerance, okay. Intolerance can very often be rooted in wanting to satisfy my every desire straight away every day. And anything else, I am just intolerant. I want instant gratification. Chemically dependent people seek instant gratification. They want every need met straight away every day when we are intolerant we fail to see our priorities get all mixed up we turn minors into majors and majors into minors we give too much attention to passing whims and tend to ignore or neglect authentic needs dogmatic attitude four impulsive very dangerous eh these are behaviors, attitude, attitudes and behaviors that we've seen in parents of men and women who've ended up in our clinic. I owe it to you to highlight this material. I owe it to you to recommend the Behavior Institute, truly. I honestly don't know how and why schools are not incorporating these relational dynamics and relational dynamics and self-understanding educationals in their curriculums. It's all about academia these days. You know, schools used to be about teaching people how to survive in the big world, in the real world. Now it's all about what kind of degree you're gonna get and blah, 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 blah. I've counseled, I'm constantly counseling people's academics, politicians. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Let's bring this down to grassroots level, okay? So dogmatic attitude four, impulsive. Impulsive and intolerance. You see, these are all interconnected. And it also is, these are the ones, these are the great grandkids of cultural um, sobriety, culturally teetotal people got cultural, you got healthy, they're getting on with it and we can turn to them at any point for guidance, counsel and example. Then you've got the cultural, it's downhill from there, then we're going all dogmatic and it's not getting any easier. Impulsive and intolerance are like Siamese twins joined at the wallet with a complete disregard for consequences. We buy things we can't afford and if grandiosity is also an issue, impulsive people can come home in a new car 
or come home having made a new business commitment that they simply can't afford. And dogmatic attitude five, indecisiveness. You see, because we're in this line of culturally defined teetotalism and it's given birth to dogmatic teetotalism, there's a genuine identity crisis. These guys really don't know who they are, what their purpose in life is. They don't know that internal sense of significance, connection, security. They don't, they don't know the, the wondrous spiritual psychological gifts of being in a recovery program. So when it comes time to making a decision, they don't know which way to turn. When we're indecis indecisive, we often fail to take any action. We just become reactive rather than proactive. We exaggerate the neg thing, negative things that might happen. We waver between options. We rarely get anything done. And we open ourselves up to sliding into depressions and self-pity. These are the spiritual, psychological and relational attitudes and consequences of the dogmatic teetotal. Is it worth it? Let's have a look at some behaviours. Sorry, let's have a look at some behaviours. Denying. Rationalising. Projecting. Overreacting and complying. Denying, rationalising, projecting, overreacting and complying. Dogmatic behaviour one, denying. Dog during dogmatic teetotalism, Whoa. Dogmatic teetotalism. To me, that sounds more dangerous, as dangerous as heroin addiction. During dogmatic teetotalism, we can often feel uneasy without knowing why. The discomforts of our relationship tensions, because the relationship tensions never go away. They destroy our ability to get in touch with our everyday present feelings. We agree that certain behaviours are selfish and destructive, yet we refuse to embrace such behaviours within ourselves. Rather than face reality, we guard our self-esteem with internal narratives, such as, no, not me, I'd never behave like that, I'd never treat my kids like that, I wouldn't speak to my wife like that. Denying. Dogmatic behaviour too, rationalising. Like denial, rationalising boosts our self-esteem for a short time. When we rationalise, we derail criticism and justify ourselves at every corner, at every conflict. We even find reasons for avoiding programmes like the Alcoholics Anonymous programme, the 12-step recovery programme. We find reasons for avoiding help our reasons sound logical, but they always sidestep our need for help. Dogmatic behaviour three, projecting. Projection means finding in others what we can't accept about ourselves. We may accuse others of being highly critical but we never listen to ourselves being highly critical. This describes our own attitude when we find others as being highly critical. It describes our own attitude towards ourselves and towards others. We accuse others of wanting to get us drunk. Dogmatic behaviour four, overreacting, overreacting. One hallmark of dogmatic teetotalism is overreacting. We get worked up over minor events or resent others for no apparent reason. We may get violent after losing a game of cards or a game of money. We may lose, we may land on Mayfair again and your wife's got three hotels on there. Next thing you know, the coffee table's gone one way, the kids have scattered. We get violent. Even if we might just miss a phone call Overreaction, overreaction often keeps us from facing bigger problems in our lives. 
And what's more, overreaction can be very dangerous to us, but more importantly, it can be really dangerous for others. Dogmatic behavior five, compliance is the killer. Compliance, compliance. When we are acting out in compliance, we seem to know all the answers and we're rarely at a loss for words. Our knowledge sounds impressive, our insights convincing. In truth, however, how our words and our deeds usually grow further and further apart. We can talk the talk, which is all kind of sounds good, but if we're not walking the talk, if we're not walking the walk, we are in dogmatic behaviors, we are dogmatically teetotalistic, and that's just a, a recipe for relapse. And this type of mindset within the parent who may never have encountered alcohol or drug addiction, this is the parenting style that can predispose our kids to a probability of becoming chemically dependent. We seem to accept criticism. We speak at length about our defects. We agree with you when you point out our defects. We don't do that about it. Our agreeing with you is complying with you. We can even convince you that we, we've actually changed for the better. And, but do you know what changes? Nothing. Dogma. Dogma is an official system of principles or doctrines from a religion or the position of a philosophic school of thought. Dogma can also manifest itself from behind a mask of contempt, disapproval and a series of enforced decisions. But now get this. In the home, whilst parents may believe themselves to be principled and philosophical, children are far more likely to tune into the messages from behind our masks. And that's what drives them towards a high likelihood of one day becoming chemically dependent. Teetotalism in recovery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's possible. Teetotalism in recovery. You might not think it. Please tune in. Attitudes of teetotalism in recovery. Gratitude. Tolerance. Humility. Focus. Self-discipline. That's what recovery sounds like. Recovery is always fueled by gratitude. Gratitude is an attitude. Okay, it's not a response to pacify, to compliment, to manipulate. Gratitude is an attitude. Gratitude is an attitude of teetotal people in recovery. I consider myself to be teetotal. I consider myself to be in recovery. My wife takes a glass of wine. I've allowed my 16 year old daughter to take a few sips of wine because I want her to be aware of what the wine is going to do to her. I, she started, she felt just a little bit lightheaded and then we chatted through it. I gave her a drink of water afterwards to maybe to help the, the um, dilute it. Because I want, I'm educate, education is empowerment, but I'm in recovery from chronic chemical dependency. I don't want my children to grow up in recovery from heroin addiction. I want my children to grow up. I want my children to individualize. Okay, and I'm really honestly, truly grateful that she knew what I was doing. I told her what I was doing. Her mom knew what we were doing. And she's far more empowered for the world in front of her than the kid who's growing up in the dogmatically, culturally teetotal, we don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't laugh, we don't joke. Yo, yeah. listen up man, relax. Attitudes of the teetotal people in recovery, gratitude, tolerance, humility, focus and self-discipline. Some of this stuff doesn't come easy, particularly if you let self-discipline drop, okay? And behaviors of teetotal people in recovery, diligence, stay focused, watch yourself. How do you watch yourself? Stay accountable. 
be accountable. Secret integrity. Secret integrity is you do nice things for people without telling anyone. Secret integrity is if there's a rule in your home that you only have maximum two sugars in your coffee. You want three sugars, but the rule is two. And if when you go to the coffee station in your home and there's only you there, you want three, but the rule is two. If you even look over your shoulder just to see if anybody's watching, you're relapsing. You've compromised your integrity. Why is there two, why can I only have two sugars, Colin? Because I said so. Dad, why can I, can I have three sugars? No, honey, you can have two sugars. Why? I don't need a why. It's just because, because I said so. And then when my daughter, when whoever it is, when you go to the coffee station, and you could take three and nobody would know, but you take two, because those are the rules. That's secret integrity. When you do nice things for people without even them knowing, that's secret integrity. When your integrity is born where nobody else can see, you become teachable. You become teachable. These are the guys who stay clean and sober. For the guy who goes in my rehab, I have the two sugar rule. I had the two sugar rule. For those guys who used to use the tablespoon for two sugars, some of those guys are dead now because without secret integrity, recovery is impossible. Without secret integrity, recovery is actually exhibitionism. It's manipulation. It's getting people to think that you're something you're not. Teetotalism in recovery, gratitude, intolerance, humility, focus, self-discipline, diligence, accountability, secret integrity. The heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. Teachability and contemplative. Contemplative, what does that mean? Okay, go to bed an hour earlier than you used to so that you can wake up an hour earlier than you used to so that you can sit and spiritually, psychologically meditate, contemplate on the day ahead. And then in the evening, you go to bed because you've gone to bed an hour earlier than you used to. You contemplate on how did the day go? What can I do differently tomorrow? Because if you'll start the day well and end the day well, everything that takes place in between is gonna be all right. It's gonna work out. It is gonna work out. I speak to you from 27, from 17 years of full-fledged membership of the addiction culture as an intravenous heroin and amphetamine addict where it was all about me self 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 i've now been in recovery for 27 years and truly 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 i really hope you receive this information <laughs>